He was a man with a history that seemed to never indicate a propensity for the horror that he became. A man that, for reasons still unknown to this day, took lives without any known motive or remorse, with a nature so impudent it's not typically seen by many serial killers before him. Tonight we discuss a man who terrorized Anchorage, Alaska, the Midnight Sun Killer, James Dale Ritchie. Let's open the serial killer file. It was November 12, 2016. Police in Anchorage received a phone call around 4.30 in the morning. A man had taken a cab ride and upon arriving at his destination, he sprung from the car and refused to pay the cab fare. So two officers were dispatched to take a look around and hopefully find the man who ripped off the taxi driver. But for police officer Arn Salau, he would come face to face with more than he was ever expecting. Officer Salah, while cruising slowly down the street, spotted a man walking along, ignoring the police officer's presence, even as Officer Salah pulled up right alongside the man. Salah asked the man to stop in order to ask him if he had witnessed the man who had fled from the taxi cab. But the man continued to ignore Salau, so Salau picked up the microphone connected to his megaphone and repeated his request to the strange, seemingly oblivious man. This is the footage taken from the dash cam of the officer's cruiser that has been released by officials. It includes what occurred before the point where things became violent. Sir, Anchorage Police, can I get you to stop? Hello, Nathan. Do you want to stop? I'll uh, try to come off here at Hope Depot. This is the Anchorage Police. You need to stop. This is the Anchorage Police. You need to stop. Officer Salau, immediately after what's shown in the footage, realized that this was no ordinary individual. The man had definitely heard the megaphone and he promptly turned and walked towards Salau's cruiser. Upon approaching the vehicle, he withdrew a Colt Python 357 Magnum revolver and opened fire on Salau from close range. Salah was struck at least four times, the bullets causing substantial damage to the officer's bones, liver, and intestines. Surprisingly undeterred and fueled by adrenaline, Salah flew out of his cruiser and returned fire on the man. The second officer that was in the area witnessed what had occurred and aided Salah in the shootout, which ultimately sent the shooter to the ground, riddled by gunshot wounds that claimed his life. Officer Salah was rushed to the hospital and thankfully survived. But this strange man's actions hung heavily in the minds of police and residents of Anchorage. His sudden explosion of violence, 
attempting to murder a police officer who was simply asking him a question that he likely could have answered and been on his way. But for some reason, he was either unable or unwilling to contain an urge to kill. Authorities retrieved the Colt Python from the scene and had it sent to the Alaskan Crime Lab. In the meantime, police ran a background check on the shooter, who they were able to confirm was James Dale Ritchie, who had been a law-abiding citizen for over 10 years with no run-ins with police. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, James had a history that made the shooting make a bit more sense. James Dale Ritchie was born on November of 1976 and grew up in Anchorage. He attended high school at East Anchorage High School. As a teenager, James stood out. He was tall and well-built as an athlete, playing basketball and football. James made good friends with two brothers named Quincy and Bobby Thompson, who he spent a lot of his time with. But James's connection to the Thompson family would take a twisted turn many years later, which would leave Bobby Thompson crushed. Aside from being an impressive athlete, James was also intelligent. He scored a 1200 on his SAT and was quickly recruited by the West Virginia University football team. He left Alaska in 1994 for school. At this time, his contact with Bobby Thompson dwindled to nothing. From friends who spent significant time together to two people who didn't speak anymore. Their lives were just in very different places, geographically and otherwise. Bobby's brother Quincy had died just before James left, which left Bobby's concerns far removed from maintaining a friendship at that time. After only a single semester at West Virginia University, however, James made his way back to Alaska. But he returned different. Something about him had changed, and his new endeavors were proof of it. After dropping out of a school that he more than earned his place within, playing a sport he excelled at and could have potentially gone pro for, James left it all behind and entered the drug trade and would eventually become an active drug dealer. Aside from this, he was also involved in dogfighting. Over the course of the next seven years, James started having inevitable run-ins with police, leading to multiple arrests, mostly for his drug-related activities. He spent from 1995 to 2005 as a criminal that police had become quite familiar with, but in 2005 he was arrested for the last time, but not for drugs. James had broken into someone's home with a set of plastic handcuffs and two handguns. Fortunately, he was caught and was unable to fulfill whatever objective was on his mind, and he was put away for two years. Once released, he purchased the Colt Python revolver. He handed the gun off to someone he knew and trusted and took off, this time for Virginia, where his parents had been residing. This brought up some moving violations, but James wasn't even called into court for it. The police were generally at ease over James now, as it seemed his life of crime was behind him. But unfortunately, he was only ramping up to reach a new height, his peak of deviant behavior. James, who managed to find a relationship, ended up in a breakup with his girlfriend, which sent him on the move again, back to Alaska, in March of 2016. He was only months away from unleashing his inner demons. He met up with his acquaintance who had been holding his Colt Python for all that time, and he took it back. James had clearly known his mind had grown excessively dark, and almost like a last flicker of his former law-abiding self before the drugs, the dogfighting, and the home invasion tried to pull James back from the edge he sought out mental health treatment. However, it's never been determined how far the treatment had gone or whether or not he ended up being diagnosed with a disorder. Eventually, that flicker of light was shrouded and the time bomb inside his mind ticked away. Then came July 3rd. It happened in Anchorage, Alaska. 
With a population under 300,000, it's Alaska's most populous city in a state that is famous for its breathtaking scenery and off-the-grid type living. Many residents of Alaska regularly take advantage of the natural aspects of their home. As far as the United States is concerned, it's one of the best places for hiking and mountain biking along the countless trails scattered throughout the state. And because of Alaska's position on the globe and the Earth's tilt in relation to its orbit around the sun, the summers there provide sunlight for much longer than what most people in the United States are accustomed to, depending on where you are in the state. In early July in Anchorage, Alaska, the sunrise occurs at about 4.30 in the morning. Sunset doesn't occur until around 11.30 at night, providing a stunning 19 hours of pure daylight. Outside of these times, civil twilight could be in effect, where, if the weather is clear, there's still enough sunlight from the horizon to provide visibility for outdoor activities. It would seem that for those who wish to attack their victims in the night, Alaska during the summer solstice would be one of the worst, most bold places to do it. But that didn't stop James Dale Ritchie. The crime lab where police had sent the Colt Python belonging to James Ritchie once he was dead came back with critical information. Police weren't surprised when the handgun had been used violently in the past, but it proved to be something more a missing puzzle piece for investigators. This is where everything that happened surrounding the shootout with police connected back over four months prior. It was the early morning hours of July 3rd, 2016, when residents of Anchorage would begin to question whether or not a peaceful bicycle ride could come to a terrible end when two bodies were discovered by a cyclist along a path near Ship Creek. 41-year-old Jason Netter Sr. and 20-year-old Brianna Foisey had been out that morning along the bike path. Both individuals had trouble littered throughout their lives. Jason Netter had a history with the police, having been involved in drugs for years. He also had family issues, particularly with his two daughters regarding child support. Things had turned so sour for Jason Netter's family that one of his daughters even had her name legally changed. As for Brianna Foisey, who was just over 20 years younger than the man she was spending her morning with, her life had been largely corrupted by drugs as well. She had been adopted by a woman named Marcella Foisey, who desperately wanted to help Brianna, and held an intervention as a last-ditch effort to save her adoptive daughter from dying due to a drug overdose. However, regrettably, Brianna refused the help, denying Marcella. Her poor life choices had resulted in Brianna living on the streets homeless. Her connection to Jason Netter to this day has not been disclosed, but it's possible that Jason and Brianna had a relationship bound by their addictions to drugs. Unfortunately, an overdose wasn't the only threat looming, lying in wait. Something much deadlier, something sadistic, was along the bike path that morning as well. James Ritchie, with Colt Python in hand, had spotted Jason Netter and Brianna Foisey coming along the path. As we know, James had a history in the underworld of drugs, but his specific motives for what he did that day remain unknown, having been locked away inside the mind of a now dead man. James raised his revolver and shot Jason and Brianna with vicious lethality and killed them both outright where they stood. Police at that time had no idea who would have committed the crime, but due to the victim's connection to drugs, it would have been a sensible theory to believe the killings were drug-related. But 26 days later, on July 29th, police were starting to realize something was even more wrong than they originally believed. Again, in the early morning hours, this time in East Anchorage, 21-year-old Travion Kindle Thompson, known by those close to him simply as Trey, was riding his bicycle home from a late shift at work. A familiar threat lurked in the woods along Trey's way. Three girls who lived nearby had been looking out their window at the time and saw a man they had never seen before, lingering before he vanished into the trees. 
Only moments later, Trey came into range, and James Dale Ritchie shot him numerous times, which sent him skidding out on the ground, bleeding profusely, but still alive. James quickly grabbed Trey's bicycle and took off on it. The girls who had spotted James just before had heard the gunshots, and police were called and arrived very shortly thereafter, soon enough to find Trey still alive. However, he unfortunately died of his injuries on the scene, making Trey the third known victim of James Ritchie. Authorities were able to ascertain that the same gun that had killed Jason Netter and Brianna Foisy had been used on Trey, but Trey wasn't involved with the drug scene. He lived a favorable life and was well-liked. He made an honest living. He loved playing video games and, according to friends, even traded his car for a laptop so he could play with his friends, which was possibly why he was riding a bicycle that early morning. A surprisingly innocuous decision that would lead to such a tragic and violent end. Even then, he was in an area that was considered safe. It wasn't like the two previous murders. The murder of Trey Thompson was especially brazen, and several witnesses were able to be interviewed, which produced a composite sketch by police for the public. Clearly, witnesses were able to get a good enough look so that the sketch, with decent accuracy, resembled James Dale Ritchie. Trey's father, who had been caught up in criminal activities, was serving time in prison when he heard about the senseless murder of his son. Distraught as any father would be, he wanted answers, and those answers would come after James Ritchie's fatal shootout with police. Trey Thompson's father was Bobby Thompson, James's former best friend who he spent weeks with at a time when he was younger. Bobby, who hadn't spoken to James since they went separate ways years before, was in utter disbelief. Bobby and those close to him who knew James when he was younger were unable to fathom the vicious killer that James had become. Bobby Thompson didn't know if James somehow knew it was his old best friend's son that he was about to kill on July 29th, and he wondered that even if James had known, if it would have made any difference at all. Bobby realized that the funny and fun-loving James Ritchie he remembered was gone. Back before the case had been solved, however, almost a month had passed since Trey's murder, and the composite sketch hadn't rendered any productive leads. On August 28th, it was like the other times, the early hours of the day. 25-year-old Bryant Day Hooson was a well-known environmental activist in Anchorage and had just purchased a new Schwinn bicycle that he was looking forward to riding any chance he got. On the early morning of August 28th, he was on a bicycle ride. His reason for being out at that time isn't fully known, but it's believed that Bryant was going to visit a friend and was cycling through Valley of the Moon Park when he came across something he never would have expected to see. James Ritchie was already in the park and had already gunned down a man beneath the park's pavilion. The victim was 34-year-old Kevin Turner, a homeless man who suffered from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, who had recently been incompatible with an assisted living facility, care that he desperately needed, but his mental disorders made difficult to get appropriately. In the meantime, Kevin had been staying in the park and likely using the pavilion as shelter, and it was here, vulnerable and exposed, that James Ritchie found him and riddled him with bullets until he was dead. It's believed that Bryant came upon this scene and James spotted him and wasted no time in ruthlessly gunning him down until he too was dead. By the time police had been called by a witness who had been jogging through the park sometime after the murders, James Ritchie was long gone and there was very little evidence left behind. However, the crime lab was, once again, able to link the murders in Valley of the Moon Park to the other murders before them with the same common thread, the weapon, the Colt Python. By this time, the Alaskan police and FBI had teamed up knowing they were dealing with a serial killer who was not only deadly, but especially so, given the fact that he was committing his murders with a handgun and had been 100% 
successful each time. He also seemed to have no regard for getting caught and would kill despite other people being nearby with a remarkably noisy weapon. Despite these final factors, he wasn't any closer to being caught. Authorities released a warning to the public, telling them to avoid trails at night into the early morning, and the FBI offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the apprehension of the serial killer yet to be identified. Upwards of 175 tips came in to authorities, and it's been noted that at least one of those tips pointed to James Dale Ritchie. But it was a fierce shootout with police that brought James Ritchie to his end and allowed authorities to determine that the man police had thankfully killed was indeed the serial killer that they had been searching for who had swept terror over Anchorage for months. And while it's confirmed that he took the lives of five people, some believe that number may be higher. But no other murders have been officially linked to James Dale Ritchie's streak of death. Alaska is known as the land of the midnight sun, and for this reason, along with the fact that James Ritchie killed most of his victims within the night, which during the summer months still experiences much light, is why I refer to James Dale Ritchie as the midnight sun killer. This case and the story of his victims isn't very well known outside of Alaska yet a land considered also to be the last frontier. Steeped in history and beauty, it's considered one of the most wondrous places in all of the United States, and it's a destination for millions of people where they can go to see things they wouldn't otherwise see in other areas of the country. And for the five victims, they called this place their home. This episode of Seriously Strange is sponsored by ExpressVPN. They're a really great service that helps to keep your online data safe. Without a virtual private network, your internet browsing data can be tracked by your ISP, your cell provider, ad companies, and hackers. When you use a VPN, however, your public IP address is masked, so even the websites that you frequently visit won't be able to identify you or target you for things you may not want. Among many other uses, ExpressVPN also helps to unblock content that's only available in some countries, allowing you to access more of the things you want to see. And you can head to expressvpn.com slash Gavigan for three months free with their one-year package. And they're less than $7 a month, which makes them incredibly affordable for the critical service that they offer. And also, ExpressVPN comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Just a few of the great things about ExpressVPN are that they're consistently faster than other providers, offer 24-7 support for their customers, and they have an app for every device, whether it's Windows, iOS, Android, Linux, and more. And they have browser extensions for Chrome, Firefox, so really it's a good fit for just about everybody. ExpressVPN supports an internet without restrictions, so you can securely stream or download content from anywhere, anytime. With ExpressVPN, your data is your business. ExpressVPN won't track it either. So take back your internet privacy today and stop letting your data and yourself be at risk. Head down into the description below and hit the link to expressvpn.com slash Gavigan and join me in feeling a whole lot better about accessing the internet with ExpressVPN. Thanks for listening. That's all for this episode. Thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe now because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.